very much, Amy. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I think Amanda is probably one of those people in the psychedelic research field who, who needs no introduction, really. Does anybody not know who Amanda Fielding is in here? Maybe I should give her a little... Well, I mean, I could probably spend all day introducing Amanda. Uh, she has contributed an, an astonishing amount to psychedelic research and has been very much a catalyst for getting where we are now currently with psychedelic research in instigating, uh, designing, implementing, stimulating so much of, of the research that we have now underway. Uh, a real kind of force of nature in this whole psychedelic renaissance, really, Amanda. So uh, I'm really, really delighted to have you here. And I'm also extremely delighted to have Cosmo, who for the last 14 years has somehow managed to escape speaking <laughs> at breaking convention. So, uh, and what a, a fantastic uh, family duo they are. Of course, if you didn't know, Cosmo is Amanda's son. So, uh, and Cosmo is also currently the, and for a while now, the CEO of Beckley SciTech, which is the uh, pharmaceutical arm or part of the umbrella of the Beckley uh, family foundation. Pharmaceutical <laughs> sounds bad, doesn't yeah, it? Well, <laughs> Well, how would you prefer to call it? I don't know. No, but, yeah. um, and so I'm really, really, really delighted to have you both here uh, together. And uh, maybe just like start by asking you, just say a little bit about what you are doing currently. And what, more importantly, because we are here and now, what it is you're most excited about currently in, in psychedelics? In psychedelics? Um, well, I think it's a very exciting stage from where it was in... Um, 1960s, late 60s, when the gates of repression had come down. And soon after that, I realized the only way to break the taboo was with the very best science, because science is the language of the modern establishment, and forget spirituality and all of that, but let's do it by science. But as a female who left school at 16 with no letters after my name, no money, it's quite difficult to do scientific research. So I had to, I set up, after 30 years of doing it in different ways through art and whatever, um, I set up a virtual, I mean, a kind of um, conceptual artwork, which was the Beckley Foundation. So I stopped being Amanda Fielding and I became a foundation with no money, I might say, but <laughs> it sounded good. And I got 10 of the best scientists in the world to be on my advisory board, and then I started doing policy and scientific research. And um, a lot happened in the 25 years, and now I'm doing what I think is the most exciting research and what I've been planning to do for all of these years, which is concentrating on LSD, which I think is my favorite compound because it's so pure and clear and works with tiny quantities. And um, I think it has amazing abilities and I'm very excited to be now be doing a program which is concentrating on LSD, both full dose and microdose. And the full dose is looking at the mystical experience, which I'd like to tell you about a bit later, at a deeper level and a personalized level than ever done before. And another one of the studies I'm very um, keen on is treating Alzheimer's, severe Alzheimer's in the case of the, my first um, observatory study, um, with um, someone who had lost the sense of self, couldn't recognize her son. And a microdose, a 10 mic dose, brought her back to full cognition, where she said, I feel so wonderful today. Let's read some poetry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have any other projects under, underway, Amanda, or that you're excited about? Well, the, the double-headed program, which is this one on LSD, is the one, it's taken me two years of preparation. I mean, getting the LSD, GMP, getting ethical approvals, all of which haven't completely been finished. But um, they're very much on the way, so I'm hoping to start very, very soon. The, I'm doing the um, 
trial on Alzheimer's at um, Basel University, and then the one on the mystical experience at King's in UCL, and um, one on microdosing LSD for autism at Harvard and Toronto, and the one on my favorite one, which has just had a co collapse, which is a tragedy to me, is uh, the one I um, was doing for the last two and a half years with Cornell, looking at how LSD changes the microvasculature, and it is investigating if it increases the capillary volume of the brain. So I think that's key. Ah, wonderful. It's good to see you're still pursuing this idea of... Uh, <laughs> Not giving blood up. ...blood flow in the brain. Yeah. 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 Not giving that one up. Yeah. Well, our Cougars would be delighted to yeah. know that you, you know, these decades, you're still pursuing that. So that's really wonderful. Um, Maybe then, Cosmo, can you tell us a little bit about what it is you do? And, and what sure, you sure. So I, mainly I'm just my mother's son, of course. <laughs> um, but but um, recently, and actually just before we go into that, Dave, it's, it's a very kind of, it's like a family reunion here because Dave was the first ever Beckley Foundation employee, I think. So but he had these long, long dreadlocks. <laughs> I was like about 14 back then. And anyway, um, so important figure. And he married me. So, so a very important figure in our, in our lives. Um, and, but, but so having been fortunate enough to grow up with my mum, I, I eventually we, we decided to, with, with all the kind of growing excitement and momentum around um, the, the kind of research around psychedelics, we thought there's the potential to take the next step, which is to kind of build on the, the science and turn it into kind of fully fledged drug development to try and make these compounds available to patients as, as medicine. So that's what we set up a company called Beckley SciTech. Um, which unfortunately is a corporation, so I'm now a kind of corporate mouthpiece, so I don't believe anything I say. But, um, but basically we're developing 5-MeO-DMT, um, so an intranasal formulation of 5-MeO-DMT for treatment-resistant depression and alcohol use, al alcohol use disorder at the moment. So we just published some data on our... Um, in patients with TRD, a small study in patients with TRD, and, and after a single dose, um, over half of them were depression-free, so in remission, depression-free a month later, and, and, and effects were sustained three months out. So that's really encouraging. We're now doing a big phase 2B Star, which is kind of multi-center, FDA approved in the US and America, US, Australia and Europe. Um, so that's the kind of main focus. And then we've also got this, this drug called LE101, which is intravenous psilocin. So, um, well, you know all about it, Dave, but it's, it's basically, um, <laughs> it's, 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 psilocin is the, is the not that, I don't know. Um, actually, we were both, so it started actually as a Beckley Foundation, the, the, you'll have probably have all seen the, the circles of this is your brain not on drugs and this is your brain on drugs, and the brain on drugs looks kind of um, much busier with all the connections, and, and that was the, the psilocybin brain imaging study that the Beckley Foundation did. We were both participants in that study and actually it was intravenous psilocybin so we, we went into an fMRI machine and were injected with psilocybin and, and basically what it what it does is it, it turns the psilocybin experience into a much much faster experience so you, it, it's kind of very quickly on and lasts quite a short time and, and very quickly off and anyway so many years later we are now trying to turn something similar into a pharmaceutical um, product. So, so, so that's currently in, in phase one healthy volunteer study. So that's what we're doing. Uh, well done. Well done. Um, I'd love to explore more about the kind of family legacy and where we are now, but just a quick question about that. I mean, this is fascinating. Do you intend on having it intravenous as a, as a clinical treatment or is this more for uh, research purposes? 
No, we are, at the moment, intravenous is, is the plan. So, I mean, it's basically the, the concept, again, it gets very much, and probably this is what we can talk about in a, in a broader question, is, you know, there's the choice between, you know, obviously lots of people who like psychedelics would probably say, well, wouldn't it be nice to be six hours long rather than one hour long? But what we're having to focus on at Beckley SciTech is kind of how do you make these drugs as kind of accessible as possible to kind of mainstream healthcare. And, and one of the things that we think would make a difference is, is making it a much shorter time for the, for the psychedelic experience, both for the, for the therapists in the room, but also for the patients and the kind of clinic and the infrastructure and the costs and everything. So that's why both 5-MeO and this IV psilocin is basically targeting a much shorter duration. So the idea is, can you get similar levels of, of like effect, but with a, an hour or two in the clinic rather than a whole day? So, so IV is a, a much faster way of getting the drug in and out, basically. Cosmo, <clears throat> you're your mother's son, <laughs> quite apparently. I'd love to ask you both how, uh, in the legacy, Amanda, you've been in this area for decades, and um, we are trying to be here now. And, and so, how have things changed? And and can you kind of reflect upon Cosmo how uh, things may be different in in your era, and where do you see it going? So, what are your reflections on being here now, having been on this very long journey so far? I mean, in a similar way, I'm not that I'm taking over, Dave, but. <laughs> I was, I was going to frame it in a slightly different way to you when we were talking about it, which is mum was, mum was friends with Albert Hoffman and made various promises to Albert um, many years ago. So the, the other question is, if you don't want to talk about it personally, you could say, you know, what do you think Albert would think about today? Yeah. Basically. Like well, that better. <laughs> well, Albert is, was a very unique and wonderfully fun man. And... The first thing I ever said to him, have you ever thought that LSD might increase the blood in the capillaries of the brain? And he said, um, I'm just a little simple Swiss chemist, but I and my wife, Anita, we hang from our feet every day for 10 minutes to get more blood in our brain. And I thought that was a very sweet Elbert-style um, answer. And anyway, I actually, I was introduced to LSD in 1965, having studied mystical experiences and religions and all of that. That had been my passion. And then in 1966, I met a Dutch scientist called Bart Hogarth, who I considered to be the only genius I've ever met. And um, he had a hypothesis of how psych he was a doctor and a scientist, how um, psychedelics worked, LSD worked, and actually um, from, from that period I lived for a long time, in those days it was actually still legal, on LSD, and when I say LSD in those days, a dose was 250 mics. So with what I learned through that, one could control one's consciousness, one can enhance one's conscious abilities, and then be in control of them. And I found that an absolutely amazing breakthrough and decided, and then the other hypothesis was about the ego mechanism and how, it, and how anyway, it's too long to go into here. But um, I found these hypotheses absolutely life-changing, and so I decided to devote I'm, my I'm life. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm yeah. your kind of annoying son, yeah. but... The question is the here and now, not oh, 1966. Right, so the here and now. What do you think about yeah. it? I think it's come on more than you could have expected in the 60s and 70s. Um, so now we are able to do this research and, um, and open um, clinics hopefully soon. I mean, it all needs to be hurried up, basically, but I think it's going in the right direction very slowly. And that's a, a problem, the slowness and the expense of doing it at the high level. 
but at least we're being allowed to do it. And it's having wonderful um, um, reactions, positive and psilocybin, uh, yeah. And now indeed, even in LSD, with this new anxiety study, which I'm delighted has got a fast forward. And um, so at last, because that's what I promised to Albert, that I would bring his problem child back into society by his 100th birthday. So, uh, uh, um, but I failed. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a thing, the oracle never tells the time. But now it is <laughs> happening, but it's whatever, 25 years later. And um, so it's wonderful to visualize that change. Great. So Cosmo, maybe you could speak about um, where, where do you see it going? Are you going to continue your mum's work for another 50, 60 years? I mean, she'll probably con continue it longer <laughs> than I will. But, but um, no, I'm, look, I think it's, yeah, I, I, I think it's an exciting time. I think, I, like, we, we've lived through it for a long time, even though I'm not that young, but younger than my mum. Um, I've, you know, we've seen it change. I mean, when I was growing up, my mum was the weirdo who took drugs and drilled a hole in her head. And now she's the visionary that I'm lucky to be her son. So, so things, you know, things have changed a lot. Um, and which is, you know, but, but it, it, you know, in, in all seriousness, the, there's, I think, I think we three would all agree that, that actually the, it, while it's slow, the speed of progress over the last five to ten years has actually, all, I would say, taken us all by surprise. It's like, look, yeah. we've, got, we've got psilocybin in phase three, we've got MDMA through phase three, hopefully being yeah. approved this year, we've got LSD about to enter phase three, we've got 5-MEO and DMT in phase three. It's like we're, we're moving pretty fast, and I think that's, yeah. that's really exciting. I think the, the, in a way, the, the question is, you know, what's the, what are the things that can still go wrong? I, but I spend my time worrying about that. But, you know, I think there's, you know, developing these compounds into pharmaceutical medicines that are going to be accessible through mainstream healthcare requires lots and lots of compromises and decisions and lots and lots of different stakeholders become involved, whether that's regulators, whether that's biotech investors, whether that's healthcare facilities and pharmaceutical companies. So I think that, I think what's really exciting about where we are today is that it's almost being accepted now that these drugs work and they're kind of safe and effective. I think the big question that remains is how do they actually, do they, well, how, what resistance will there be to them being actually integrated into mainstream healthcare and, the, and even beyond, I guess. But I think I'm very much obviously in favor of not only introducing it into the healthcare, but um, organizing it so that ordinary healthy individuals can take these compounds safely, legally, and um, benefit for wellness, transformation, and all the things we know can come of it. And I always thought, actually, once it gets over the major taboo, it will ha work very quickly. It will break through because it is so positive. That is the reality of these things. They really are positive. And so I feel it should break through, but we should get breakthroughs much quicker because there are terrible suffering in the world. And like my interest in microdosing LSD for Alzheimer's, which I know can work with certain people, that is the most far, fastest growing route of death and 70% um, of care homes are filled with Alzheimer's, etc. It's a growing problem of acute unhappiness. And I think what I've now kind of planned, which is how you 
dose it, have a protocol of it, and also how you provide it in the best setting, um, we could start, start that tomorrow, and I know the leading um, care home in England, the chair of it, would love to do that. But you can't do it until you've done all the processes, which take years and years, and then cost millions and millions. And I think we should have a fast forward going, so we can speed things up where it's of great need. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well done, Amanda. Well done, Amanda. Um, I feel like we need to speed things up, unfortunately, because as much as this is a fun conversation, <laughs> we've actually nearly run out of time, which is deeply unfortunate, but uh, such is the nature of these events. Um, and I'd maybe actually explore a more frivolous or fun uh, point to end on. And Cosmo, you know, you said how uh, when you were growing up, you know, your mother was the weirdo, drilled a hole in the head, and, and now she's, you know, she's transformed from Lady Mindbender <laughs> to the Queen of LSD and psychedelics, which is, you know, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a brilliant journey to see this, this transformation in the, in the media and the mainstream and everything yeah. that's, that's happening. Um, but I just want to maybe ask a quick question about this idea of, um, you talked about blood flow to the brain and the idea of trepanation, which you pioneered uh, yeah. very much a long time ago. Yes. And actually, once about 10 or 15 years ago in a pub, no, in, a, in an Italian restaurant just around the corner from here, Cosmo and I agreed uh, to get trepanned at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, as a bet, we should be having that yeah. I'll, I'll be still going to yeah. do that. We definitely have to. Okay. Psychedelics yes. are way too mainstream. We need to set up a new conference about trepanation yes. yeah. and we're going to get trepanned. Yeah. Is, that's the next step. And we, yeah. we gave uh, my children a gift for a Christmas present, I think it was, of a free trepanation. <laughs> This was long ago, and they haven't yet taken it up, and I'm very shocked <laughs> by that. But, so, maybe yeah. that'll be the, the next uh, new frontier, once exactly. we've got psychedelics over the line. Definitely. Yeah. Like, seriously revisit I, I'm, I'm seriously very keen to Watch the research. space. Yeah. Watch the space, everyone. <laughs> do research on trepanation, because I think what it does is restore the brain circulation to the level it was at in childhood. So it's nothing like taking cannabis or taking acid, but it's a level higher than the adult level. And I think that's incredibly valuable, particularly in aging, because aging is very much based on deterioration of cerebral circulation, and the mitochondria are not functioning enough to produce the energy needed. And LSD, I'm doing research now, which can test these things and their production of ATP. And it, it's very good news, and it should be available. So uh, we know it's safe because every brain operation is um, predated by. I mean, the first thing happens at the person's trepanned. So it happens thousands of days, every times, uh, you know, a day. Maybe but, that'll be the next conference then. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm going to have to draw time on this really, <laughs> really wonderful uh, trilogue. And just like, just great gratitude to you both for this wonderful legacy of work and everything you've contributed towards, you know, gathering psychedelics and getting them into the mainstream. Thank you so yeah. very much. <laughs> yeah.